Blog Talk Radio. Hello and greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Psychic Inside Show. My name is Joelle, and I am the Vibrarian, and I am here to elevate, enlighten, and empower you with positive information that I hope you find uplifting and helpful. Every Tuesday night, I'm here on the Vibrary Radio Network on on Blog Talk Radio, and I'm having a conversation each week with the most fascinating and amazing people. I believe that everyone is psychic, and you just may not recognize it. So each week I bring on people who are willing to share their story of their journey with the hope that it will trigger something in you and you will then come into a deeper knowing about an aspect of yourself that you may have been doubting before. Our show can be heard through streaming, of course, on the Blog Talk Radio system, and you can also call 646-668-8988 to listen in live during the show. If you have any questions for our host, you can always press the one key, and that will let me know that you have a question to ask, and I will get you on as soon as possible during the show. I would also like to invite you to connect with me on Facebook. I'm putting together a community that I like to call the Good Vibe Tribe, and we come together to share uplifting information. I'm always posting articles, memes, forwarding information, putting links to events and happenings around town, anything that I think is going to enrich the community. And, of course, people share things to pass along to other like-minded individuals as well. Now, you can find me on Facebook with The Vibrarian, and that is V as in vibration, I-B-E as in energy, R-A-R-I-A-N. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter, and would love to connect with you in that space. If you see something that's fun, funny, enlightening, positive, or empowering, just tag me because I would love to pass it out to the rest of my network. And, of course, I capture those moments that I'm seeing out in this world of ours that I think would be uplifting for you because it uplifts me. So join me in that space, and let's share some pictures and tweets and things with each other. (laughs) So Every week on Tuesdays is the Psychic Inside Show, and on Thursday evening is the Vibrarian Show. And the Vibrarian Show is just a talk show. We get to talk about any topic of mysterious, from mysterious to mundane. We've been talking Akashic Records, Astral Projection, Lucid Dreamings. There really is no stone that I want to leave unturned. So I do hope that you will tune back in on Thursday evenings for our conversations that we have at that time. On the Psychic Inside Show, I have been having a series of of conversations with people who I have either had services with at psychic fairs here in Atlanta or who I've met through the events that I've hosted myself, and then friends of friends who turn out to be psychic have been finding their way around. And my guest this evening, I must say I've known about her for quite some time, several years, because it seems like everywhere I would go, I would see her. And if I didn't see her in person, I would pick up a metaphysical magazine from one of the stands around town here in the Atlanta area, and her smiling face would be looking back at me nine times out of ten. <laughs> and so I'm really excited this evening to welcome Lisa DX to the Psychic Inside Show. Welcome, Lisa. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me, Joelle. It's a pleasure. Well, you know, I know that we recognize each other by face, rest not by name, because our paths have been crossing up for uh, some time. I've been probably more aware of you than you were of me, but you always are smiling every time I see you, and that certainly is something that I look for when I'm out in public. Now, you are a you're many things. You're a psychic medium, a pranic healer. Uh, I know that you teach classes, you facilitate workshops, and you just seem to be a kind of a woman for all seasons. Have you been doing this for all of your life? I have not. I am probably what one would consider a late bloomer um, in terms of this type of work. Um, however, I think that the awareness that has kind of been in my realm or around me, that's been 
around for a while. Um, for me, my, my journey kind of started with a recurring dream. So it all started mm. with a dream, right? That sounds really dramatic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it all started with a dream. And mm-hmm. what the dream involved for me was it was about a house. So this was recurring. I would always be inside of a house, and I would discover hidden rooms. And a lot of times mm-hmm. the rooms would be in a state of disarray. Sometimes they would be lavishly decorated, but it was always a pleasant surprise for me. So, mm-hmm. you know, and I had, this, I had this dream for a number of years. Then in 1995, I met my husband. And mm-hmm. when I met him, I noticed that I had the dream more frequently. He and I had a very, very strong cosmic connection. We had a lot of synchronistic events, a lot of blown light bulbs. Um, a lot of <laughs> things just kind of started happening <laughs> all at one time. And um, it was it was bizarre to me, but it was also interesting and kind of intriguing. All of this was kind of happening all at once, but I really didn't know what any of it meant. And then one day I was uh, on a trip. I went to Seattle, and I was in probably what is like the world's biggest Barnes and Noble ever. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. inside on the shelf was this teeny tiny little dream book. It was like half mm-hmm. the size of a regular book. And I looked in the dream book, and in the dream book it said that houses – are a metaphor for oneself and that hidden rooms are unexplored aspects of oneself. Mm. And I thought, Mm. wow, it really resonated with me. It really spoke Mm -hmm. to me and it made me want to know more, but I still didn't really know what to do with it. But from that, I started saying, okay, maybe there's something to all of this. And I also Mm -hmm. noticed that I started having a lot of experiences outside of being with my husband. I would meet people. Sometimes I would just know things about them. I would have certain feelings about situations. It was just different. And after that, um, I was surfing the Internet one day. I saw some online classes. I saw some in-person classes. And then I saw some classes for psychic development at one of the local bookstores here in the Atlanta area. Mm -hmm. I contemplated it for a whole year before I actually signed up to take the classes. And after that, as they say, the rest is history. (laughs) (laughs) No, were you kind of just maybe connecting the dots that what you were experiencing was psychic or, you know, the year that you took to kind of process, how were you like explaining or cataloging these magical kind of things that were happening to you? I think, I I think it was a connection of dots because these things were occurring and I was not really, you know, I thought they were cool. You know, they were interesting things, but I never really thought about them being something out of the norm in a sense. I mean, I knew that it was on some level, but then there was also another level that sort of brushed it off. And I think mm-hmm. it, wasn't out of, it wasn't really out of fear because I didn't have um, fear around it, but I had more of a fear around, okay, if I embrace this, what does this mean? Mm-hmm. How does this change my mm-hmm. life? And mm-hmm. I think that was the thing that made me kind of hold it at bay for as long as I did before I really, mm-hmm. you know, began to delve into it. Not to mention, I never really thought about a person being a psychic and making a living at it because, oh. you know, at the time, the people that I kind of knew of, I knew about like John Edward, you know, I'd seen him on TV. I knew about, you know, uh, Von Prague. And I mean, so it was just a smattering of individuals that I really knew did that type of work, but it just never occurred to me that, okay, you could do this and this could actually be your profession. This is what people mm-hmm. could do to make a living. So that was definitely another factor that, that kind of helped me off as well. Um, because again, you know, being married and then at that point I had children, I was like, okay, so, uh, how exactly am I going to explain to my husband that this is what I'm going to (laughs) do? 
So you and him were not joking around the table all the time. Well, you probably were joking about the fact that another light bulb blew, honey. Can you go get the next light bulb? But were you connecting it to like an energetic in the psychic realm or was it explained away like, wow, we just carry a lot of static electricity on the carpets or, you know, what kind of conversation, what does it look like when you're talking about that with your husband? (laughs) You know, I think first it probably was kind of explained away of like, wow, you know, what's going on? I mean, we just, you know, we kind of would joke about it. Oh, we must really have some, you know, really intense energy (laughs) around throwing these light bulbs like this. Um, you know, we couldn't keep an electronic, you know, running. Um, we still kind of have issues with that. We we joke about mm-hmm. that a lot. And, you know, our, our ongoing joke was, well, we're just cosmic. We're just cosmic. You know, that's what, that's what we always used to say to each other. So it was, it was kind of fun. Um, and then I think as time progressed for me, you know, I just started to think, okay, maybe there's something to this, maybe this energy mm-hmm. thing, there, there's, you know, something to this whole thing. And it led me to, you know, reading and research and classes and just kind of an expansion of my awareness is what I really feel like happened. Um, mm-hmm. And as you said, it was sort of breadcrumbs down the road leading me there, mm-hmm. but I don't think at the time I really realized that's where it was taking right. me. That hindsight being twenty twenty and all of that, right? <laughs> yeah. You can see it now, but at the time when you're in it, you know, it feels different. Now, did you have this reoccurring dream in childhood, or when do you, like, recall it emerging into your awareness? I recall it in my late 20s. Um, that's when I feel like it started because it was prior to – meeting my husband, and I probably, honestly, I probably had the dream roughly about 15 or 16 years, and, mm. you know, it was it was very odd to me that I would have this dream for that, you know, long period of time, but again, I don't think that I really realized, because I, I, did, I was reading books and, you know, doing a lot of different things, but nothing ever really spoke to the dream specifically or maybe what the dream could possibly mean until I had Mm -hmm. that experience when I went to Seattle. And then when I just read that one line, because basically I took the book off the shelf, opened it up and said, Mm -hmm. get in room. And then I was Mm -hmm. like, that's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what you've been trying to tell me basically all these years that I just wasn't taking heed to. I just didn't really understand the message. Um, but once I took the psychic development classes, the dream stopped. Mm, mm -hmm, So I knew that that was where they were leading me to, and even to this day, whenever my guides are pushing me to do something different or add something to my work, um, I have that dream. Mm. I'll dream of a house with hidden rooms, and I think mm-hmm. because uh, it took me so long, I was so thick-headed for so long, it took me so long mm-hmm. to get it, but now that when I finally got it, they're like, okay, we can use this. Mm-hmm. And now we, this is our way of letting her know that, yes, there's something else that we want to do, that we, you know, that we're pushing her towards, that we want her to do. You know, as a librarian in my former 3D life, I love when a book is at the seed of a person's knowledge awareness. It's like it makes my little librarian heart so happy (laughs) to know that, you know, (laughs) books really do change lives for people. And you would not happen to remember this little book name, would you? I believe it was called The Field Guide to Dreams. Um, I know that I still have it because I kept it for sentimental reasons. Um, So it's somewhere on my bookshelf, but I'm almost positive that that's the name of it. And it, I mean, it changed my life. You know, as you said, it was, it was a book that had a very profound impact. Um, Honestly, after I read that, I don't think that I read very much else in the book. Um, I do dream interpretation. That is part of the service that I offer. But um, 
my methodology for dream interpretation is a little bit different from symbolism Mm -hmm. in books. So because I think that when people have dreams, it's a very personal thing, and I know that Mm -hmm. symbols can be different from individual to individual. But I have kept that book on my bookshelf because, again, it's such a, a huge part of who I am and where I am now. Well, I do always try to provide extra information on the episodes to the listeners, so I will be looking to see if I can find out uh, if that book is in existence or, you know, and still available just because it's been something that was important to a person who experienced awakening. So thank you for that. I'm just doing a happy librarian dance right now. So now you decided finally after kicking her for a year that you were going to go see what psychic development classes were all about. What did yeah. you experience and discover? One of the main things that I discovered, and this is something that I'm very passionate about now, and I, I tell everyone this, and I know you share this belief as well, is that in a sense, they didn't really teach me anything. Mm-hmm. However, mm-hmm. They gave me the avenue. You know, they kind of opened the door and said, hey, all of this is available to you. And the feeling that I had about it, and I still have this feeling, is it sort of like you were traveling around town on the bus or using Lyft or Uber or walking, but all along you had a garage with a car parked inside, and you just didn't know it. Yes, that's a great analogy. <laughs> Going the hard way, the long way, the effort way, you know, it gets you there, but there's another yeah. vehicle available. I love that. Yes, and that that's how I felt. That's exactly how I felt during the classes because it was like, wow, all of this is out there. This exists for me. You know, I can access information this way, and it was just, utter amazement. And then the other part was, I feel like he gave me community because, you know, of course in classes, you realize there are other people out there that are walking the path. You know, they're, they're on the quest like you are and, you know, their car is parked in the garage too. And Mm -hmm. you all could have a convoy. (laughs) You could be driving all around town together. So I, I made some really lasting friendships from the class. I feel like I learned so much in terms of just awareness and awakening. Um, a lot of the techniques that were presented to me felt familiar to me. So it was almost mm-hmm. like, again, I wasn't learning anything that was brand new, but it was just sort of we're reminding you that you know this. Mm-hmm. And I really – so strongly believe in that philosophy um, because my focus statement is journey inward and discover yourself because you're always there. You didn't go anywhere. And it's kind of a journey back to you, you know, and realizing that you do have intuition that works. You do have Mm -hmm. psychic ability. You know, all of these things are there. They haven't gone anywhere, but it's just about rediscovering those things and realizing there's a different way that you can live your life. There's There are tools that are available to you that can make your life exactly what you want it to be, and it's just about you opening your eyes and saying, oh, there they are. Okay, I'm going to start using Mm -hmm. them now. -hmm. Now, what was the first kind of, vehicle or car that you then discovered was in your your garage what what gifts did you, did you first really start to emerge with in after school or through school one of the things that really struck me while I was going through the psychic development classes was the mediumship um because honestly I didn't really think that I would connect with that portion of the work But it was actually a portion of the work that really surprised me. And I found out that um, I connected easily with um, departed loved ones. They would come through. I could hear them. I'm I'm very clear audience, so I could hear them, you know, just as if you and I were having a conversation. 
they mm-hmm. were very descriptive. You know, um, sometimes they would give me names. Sometimes they would describe something to me. So that sort of surprised me. And, mm-hmm. again, it wasn't something that I was necessarily looking for or expecting, but it was, it was a portion of the work that really stood out. And I enjoyed that portion of, of the, you know, psychic work, but I also felt pushed to do more of healing, and I really wanted to concentrate on helping people to move forward because that was something that was very, very important to me. And in my mm-hmm. former life, um, I was a training facilitator. Mm-hmm. So mm. it was very natural. I kind of had a natural segue that was sort of built in for me in terms of education and classes and facilitating learning and, you know, just the whole facilitation process because I, I do view facilitation differently as opposed to teaching because I, I feel like mm-hmm. facilitation or a facilitator is there to help mm-hmm. facilitate learning. So they're there to help. It's not about them telling the person something, whereas I feel Mm -hmm. like with the teacher, at least the traditional role of a teacher is more like they kind of dump information out there and, you know, as the student, you pick it up. But Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, a facilitator's role is to kind of help you uncover the information or help you kind of have your own moments where you're just like, oh, I get it. Yes. (laughs) That was something that I was very, very passionate about. So um, basically it was kind of a thing where I was sort of trying to figure out, okay, how do I make all these different things that I'm really interested in, my background as a training facilitator, wanting to do healing, how is all of this going to come together? And honestly, I did Mm -hmm. not know the answer, um, but I did consult with my guides, and I asked. I said, you know, if this is all going to work out, you guys got to show me. Cause I don't, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. but, and they were like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll show you, we'll, we'll work with you. We'll, we'll show you how this is going to come together. And then I found that again, it was very easy for me to transfer into doing classes that were just about a different topic. So for instance, instead of, you know, doing a class on seven habits for highly effective people, which is <laughs> one of the classes I taught as a training facilitator, mm-hmm. awesome class, by the way. Um, yes. Then it was like, okay, you can do a class over here on candle magic. You can do something mm-hmm. on, um, you know, packing your spiritual backpack on crystals because it really was the same process in terms of putting together a class. It was just different subject matter. Right. And then the next, the next thing that happened for me was uh, my desire for the healing component And I was in a health food store one day with a really good friend of mine, and there was a woman there who was doing a demonstration on pranic healing. And um, my friend said, hey, let's go down here and see this demonstration. And I was like, okay. So we went down, we watched the demonstration, and I was like, that's it. That's, Mm. that's That's the missing healing component for me. So I got her information. Um, I went through a certification class with her maybe two or three weeks from the time that I saw her, and I realized that this was something that I also needed to incorporate into my work. Mm -hmm. So it was was kind of, you know, a thing where everything started to fall into place for me. All Mm -hmm. of the pieces moved into place, and I feel like the start of it was – making the decision to take the psychic development classes because it was almost like that just kicked the door down Mm. and it allowed everything else that was supposed to come to me to flow in. I was thinking when you first were telling the story of the light bulbs, you know, and I knew that you were a pranic healer and it is like, okay, you were moving energy clearly very strongly prior to uh, any kind of training at all, you know. Uh, and from yeah. my experience of pranic healing, and for our listening audience, I would love for you to share a little bit about pranic healing as a modality. But from my awareness, it is it is very directed and very powerful as opposed to Reiki, which is kind of 
it is very directed, but it can be very soft. <laughs> soft and fuzzy words can be a lot more strong. So, I mean, um, and and also if you could speak a little bit about the education that goes into becoming a pranic healer, because I understand it's rather rigorous. Yes, it most definitely can be. And it really does depend on how far you really want to go with it, because there are many levels uh, to pranic healing. And as you said, for clarity, um, the basis of pranic healing is about clearing the auric field. So the auric field is our energetic body, and roughly it's anywhere between about a half inch to about three to five feet uh, from the body. It has about seven layers to it. And the premise on pranic healing is that things are held in the aura. So we hold emotions, um, we hold things from the environment, things from other people, and all of these things can be held in our aura. And if it is not cleaned or cleared out, it will manifest on our body physically. So the basis for pranic healing is about clearing that, and it's all no touch, so you're using your hands to clear and you use sweeping motions to clear the old energy off and then deposit clean energy in, again, through the hands, all no touch. Mm -hmm. So it is very powerful. It is very directed. Um, It is a very highly proven system as well in terms of success rate, and there are actually places that use it um, in hospitals, um, very, very much so in Asian cultures. And um, it's something that's been around for, you know, many, many years, but just is not as well known here in the United States. I've heard several anecdotes of doctors who are also trained in chronic healing who incorporate, I'm assuming unbeknownst to anyone necessarily, but they're just as they're using their skill in surgery, surgery as the doctor, then they're also adding that added layer of um, energetic work <laughs> in incorporating what they're doing with the actual tissues and flesh, <laughs> you know. And I think that would be, I would love to have more people operating and delivering services from an energetic standpoint than a chemical medicine standpoint. <laughs> You know, um, and I'm kind of glad to see that places like uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America have started listing Reiki as a complementary therapy that's recommended. Certainly the the term pranic healing has gotten quite a bit more prevalent just in my own personal awareness in like the last five years. I'm hearing it used a lot more frequently, which is good. You know, when things come into more popularity with the quote-unquote normal world instead of just the conscious community, that's always a good sign. Now, do you teach pranic healing? I do not teach it, and mainly because my modality has become very much blended with a lot of other things. Um, And probably a pranic healer like a a person that's strictly practicing pranic would probably look at what I'm doing and say, what is she doing? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is simply because it has become a very blended thing for me. Um, And basically I was led by my guides to add Mm -hmm. certain components into my work. And as it was given to me, I added it in. So I use handheld crystals. Um, I check the chakra system with the pendulum um, I use a biomat, and if you're not familiar with a biomat, it is wonderful, but it is basically a mat that is embedded with crystals. It has amethyst and black tarlamine crystals in it, and it uses far infrared heat, which is really gentle and non invasive. It's the same heat they use on preemie babies in a hospital. And mm-hmm. it kind of amps up everything that I'm doing. So while you're having service with me, you're laying on this mat. I'm performing, you know, the pranic sweeping motions, but then I'm psychically open. So I'm getting information, and I jot that information down, and at the end of the session, I share that information with you. Um, I've also, you know, incorporated 
aromatherapy, also a component of sound therapy because I use chimes for clearing. I use selenite wands, copper wands. So it's become a very, very, very layered process that I practice. Um, I probably should come up with some fancy name for it, <laughs> and it, but I have, I have not done that as of yet. <laughs> well, you're probably not learning th- done learning things that you're going to be adding to it. You know, uh, <laughs> that is I, one I thing I tell. That. <laughs> I tell people all the time that we are in this space of. Uh, there's a transition, you know, the old frameworks of things across all professions were very much rigid, structured, ordered, institutional. That was the energy of it. But we are emerging into the time of individualized awareness. So there's nothing wrong with uh, reading a book and learning how to do something, going to a class and learning how to do something. But if your inner intuition or guidance or, you know, it's like a chef, you can follow the recipe in the recipe book to the T, but if you really know how to cook, you'll know that, you know what, I'm not using cumin today. I'm going to use... coriander i don't know i'm sure there's chefs that are listening are like no don't do that but you know what i'm saying you have the ability to learn something integrate it and then do it your way it doesn't have to be so rigid and many people then will look at themselves and say you know what well i do that but it's not exactly like the book said it should be or like the instructor said it should be and then they begin to doubt that they're doing it right with the air quotes I'm making, you know what I mean? And so I love that you're saying I'm blending. I'm really adding all this stuff to my practice, and I'm finding it effective. And no, it doesn't have a name, but it is definitely verifiable for the people who experience this service with me that it is effective in healing with them. I think that's wonderful. (laughs) Yes, yes. Yes, very much so. And and as you said, I agree with you that I feel like it's still evolving because I kind of think about, you know, when I first learned pranic healing and how my practice was and how much it has changed and evolved. And as I said, I feel like my guides are constantly working with me and bringing me new ideas and saying this is something you need to add or this is something you need to take out or, you know, maybe do less here or more here. So I I totally agree with you that it's something that's constantly evolving, and I'm I'm very grateful for that. I am I'm very humbled by it, and I think that it's something that keeps me evolving as a practitioner because I know that there's more to come, and I can always look forward to that. Now, when you finished your psychic development school, you walk out the door, you have your certifications and all of that. What next? Do you return to like your corporate reality or do you all, you know, just like, well, I'm just launching my business now. What what happened after that point? <laughs> Well, for me, I definitely returned to my corporate reality. <laughs> um, that 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 was step one, and I'm going to tell you that first weekend was tough. <laughs> mm-hmm. Of kind of realizing mm-hmm. classes were over, and I didn't have you know kind of that community anymore because the classes I took they were modular, and you know we met for a weekend I think every month for six months. So at the end of that six months. I did, I experienced a sense of kind of deflation of having Mm -hmm. to return to, you know, the corporate world and, okay, this is what I do. And, and I mean, the thing is, I always, I loved what I, I loved my work. I really did. But I noticed I did feel differently about it because again, now I had this whole nother world that I was aware of or this whole other realm. So, um, Very soon after I finished classes, I was like, okay, I need to work at a fair. I need to find a place where I can go and practice this skill set. I need to do something. So I actually started with phone readings. That was was my avenue. That That was my outlet. So for a 
a fair amount of time, I didn't even see clients face to face. <laughs> I, I just did phone readings. Um, and then um, the education portion kind of started, you know, biting me again where I was like, okay, I need to develop some classes. I, I need to do some things. And, you know, th- I, I got to get this going. So I actually mm-hmm. did fairs. The first place I did fairs was with the Atlanta Metaphysical Center. And okay. um, so I did those like once a month. And, you know, again, I felt the fire under me for classes and different things. So I started developing material for classes. I kind of had ideas for things that I wanted to do. Um, So I started putting the material together. I started putting together my PowerPoints, my handouts, everything. You know, and I approached Mm -hmm. it much like I approached my facilitation work that I did professionally. And I figured if I do it, then I am going to get the opportunity to present Mm-hmm. And I did. That opportunity was given to me, um, and I am very grateful for it, by the Open Mind Center. And um, I went in there one day shopping, actually, and I spoke to the owner, and I said, you know, hey, I noticed that you do classes. Um, are you looking for facilitators? You know, are you interested in having people from outside come in and do classes? And she said, sure. Mm-hmm. You know, I would love that. So we set up a meeting. And I started to do classes there. And so that was my first foray into, you know, doing these metaphysical classes. And I absolutely loved it. And the thing was Mm -hmm. I wanted to do more, you know. So at that point I was like, okay, I've got to find more outlets. I've got to find more places that I can go. And that's exactly what I did. And um, that led me to synchronicity. Um, Mm -hmm. I worked at the Blue Barn. I mean, pretty much any place that I could work. You know, doing the work. I I was doing it. I was out there and I was doing it. And there were times that, honestly, I would work seven days a week, which was really, really hard. That was tough because I do have a family. You know, I have two children. I have a husband. Um, my, my mom's 88. You know, she lives in my household. So it was a lot. Plus, just a lot mm-hmm. on me physically, you know, and mentally mm-hmm. just to be in the space of work for seven days. And, um I also noticed that I started to get really disgruntled at work, Hmm. you know, on my professional job. I I noticed that little things that didn't bother me before really began to irritate me. Um, Just kind of a succession of events that I, it made me realize that that was no longer where I was supposed to be. So you were doing seven days a week of psychic teaching and work on top of your five days a week, nine to five work. Well, I was doing my nine to five. Yeah, I was doing my nine to five. I would do phone readings Mm -hmm. in the evening sometimes. And then on the weekends, I was doing the psychic work. So it was just seven days of work. Yes, it was seven days of work. Many many weeks were like. And I was, you know, and I I pretty much, I said to my guys, I can't continue like this. You guys know I can't do this. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, you just know I can't. And Mm -hmm. I was, again, I said, show me, you know, show me, show me how to make this work. Show me what needs to be done. If I'm really to do this work, which I felt like at that point I was, show Mm -hmm. me how to make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, put the pieces in place for me. And I, I was I was led um, to a wonderful, wonderful place um, called the Magical Attic. And the Magical Attic was uh, is located well was located in Buckhead. It's no longer open, but it was located in Buckhead, oh, yes. and it was on top, on top of a cafe. And, yes, um, yes. You're familiar with it. Yeah, right? Cafe Jonah. <laughs> yeah, yeah Cafe right. Jonah, exactly. Exactly. So I was I was led there. Uh, a really good friend directed me there, and you know I, I met met up with the people there. Um, Sheila Polstein, who is actually one of my office mates now, she's an intuitive astrologer and she's wonderful, by the way. But she is one of my mm-hmm. office mates. But I met Sheila, and I started to work out of the magical attic and do readings there. And around that time. Um, I was just getting pushed more and more towards, okay, you need to be doing this work full time. So some personal things happened that kind of 
let me know, okay, you you, you really need to look at this. And one of the uh, major things was that um, my mom was having some health challenges, which, you know, I'm happy to say she fully recovered from. She's doing very, Yay. very well. Mm-hmm. But she was having some health challenges at the time, and so I decided I would take a leave of absence so that I could be here to take her to doctor's appointment kind of about her leave. And um, I took that opportunity to do that. And while I was off for leave, again, I was in constant communication with my guides, and I said, please show me um, what needs to be done so that I can make a move or transition into this work full time. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity kind of came around for me to take a retirement. So I was like, okay, I can do this. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I researched it and, you know, found all the information that I needed to find out about it, and I decided to retire and go full-time on blind faith into mm-hmm. the metaphysical work that I felt like I was really put here to do. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Well, you know, it wasn't really blind faith because you had your clear cognizance, your clear audience, your, you know what I'm saying? You had your guide, you were tuned in. That's the best vision that you can have is from the higher realms, <laughs> you know, but I understand what you're saying. How how long ago, how many years ago was this then that you've been supporting yourself in, in your gift work? I retired roughly about two years ago. So I've been Mm -hmm. doing the work full time for about two years. Um, And that's how long I've been in my office space um, because, you know, the cafe closed. um, So we were kind of in a position of like, okay, what are we going to do now? Because we really Mm -hmm. didn't want things in with the magical attic. So again, um, you know, myself and two, two other individuals that work there at the attic, Sheila and Beth, um, we decided that we would rent office space and we would become the magical muses. Mm-hmm. And that's, okay. that's, that's, that's the office space that I share now with them. And it's really, really a wonderful, wonderful working environment because we are, you know, three women that are working together. Um, you know, we have our individual practices, but we are very much connected. We support one another. We are, um, very much in tune with each other, and it's great to have kind of a, a inter-referral system that's right there in your office, you know, so I can say, oh, you need an astrology reading? Okay, you need to call mm-hmm. Sheila. Um, and then Beth is a, uh, Beth Peters is a psychic medium and animal oh, communicator. Okay. So I can, I've I can heard say, her name before. Yeah, she, she's wonderful. And then, you know, I do the healing, I do coaching, you know, so there are a lot of different things that I do. And we all have something that we bring to the table that's different, and it works in perfect tandem. So I I feel like, you know, it was sort of like the stars aligned to kind of bring us together, and then we were able to come together and kind of create our own magic. And it's been wonderful. It's been absolutely wonderful. I mean, I I don't regret a day of it. When I look back, I kind of say, wow, that's what I used to do. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And, you know, when when I posted uh, about your – when I posted about your show this evening, when I looked up your, you know, Magical Muses, I did not realize that that was your creation. I was familiar with Synchronicity, of course, and Elysium, and those are the places that I found that you were teaching stuff. But um, I will definitely reshare that link because uh, that is your baby. That's, you know, the birthing of your uh, your partner there. So I think that's awesome. Now, is this physical space where you see clients in this space or you is it office working space and you do things elsewhere we see clients there and and you know and i have to say it's the birth of three women <laughs> i can't i can't take yes, credit yes, for all yes of it's a co-creation so it's really yes is, yeah, it really is a, a joint creation you know exactly exactly it was it was a joint creation for for all of us um, coming together and saying, yeah, we're going to do this. But, um, 
yes, I see clients there. You know, I have office space there. Uh, that is where I see my clients. Um, from time to time, we do special events. Uh, we have done fairs in the past. We've hosted galleries and classes. Uh, but for the most part, because our space is relatively small, because it's basically three private offices, um, mm -hmm. I go outside to do my classes so that I can have more participants. So it's kind of a, you know, uh, it has to do with venue size. So that is why I kind of branched out with Elysium, um, working with Sarah there. I mean, it's been great. And, you know, everybody that, you know, I've worked with, and I feel like I've been very, very fortunate that everybody that I've reached out to or said, you know, this is something that I'm trying to do or I want to do, they have really been so accommodating and welcoming to me, and I feel so fortunate that the metaphysical community has really embraced me the way that they have um, because I know sometimes with the community, you know, you have, you have veterans, mm -hmm. you have people that have been doing this for a number of years, and I consider myself to be fairly new to it, even though I was doing, you know, some of the work for a number of years before I kind of went, you know, public, so to speak where I had an office, mm -hmm. my own office. But um, everybody has been such a huge supporter and been so encouraging that I'm, I'm really, really grateful for that and so proud to be a part of it. Well, that is one thing that I can say in Atlanta, especially, you know, that's where I'm based out of and so many of the people who've been on my show Everyone knows each other and has either done classes with someone, produced something, been at a fair with someone, had a little practice circle with other people. And so it, I love the fact that most people, if you're most, I won't say all, but most people, if you are in this as a full-time thing, it's because you want to help people and elevate people. And so community is very much about sharing, like people have shared knowledge just sitting in the bookstore synchronicity. I've had, uh, you know, Dr. Taylor, you know, share 10 minutes of wisdom that was like, oh, my goodness, you know, or uh, meeting somebody out in the street somewhere and saying, oh, I remember you. You're, you know, you read over at uh, the Blue Barn you know, a few moments, and if you had a question, then they would clarify or drop a little bit of uh, knowledge on me in that moment. And I love that fact, you know, and I think it speaks to people being better able to serve the public when there is not an attitude of, you know, uh, this is my knowledge, it's me and my special skill, and if I teach you my special skill, you, you know, you wouldn't even be able to grasp that you're a mere mortal, you know, kind of idea. And I don't find that a lot. It is around there sometimes, but, you know, um, I'm very fortunate, and I'm like you, that we have a lot of the same circles and the places that you're mentioning for anyone in the Atlanta area definitely would recommend that you, you know, take a trip to some of these business places and support them because they are all generally the love child of someone who's a conscious or metaphysician who wants to make a public contact point available not just for themselves but for other psychics, readers, and healers and for the community to find them there. So I definitely agree with you about that. And I know that you teach um a psychic development class. So would you share with our listeners about what, you know, what does this class entail? What does one do when they want to be psychically developed? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I like the way that you put that, psychically developed. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Um, I do a weekend psychic immersion class. It's um, very intense but fun, you know, and that that's kind of my tagline on it too. I tell people, you know, get ready. And what it is, it's a Friday night, a Saturday all day, and a Sunday. So it's two and a half days. And in the class, we do a lot of stuff. 
Um, the evening, Friday evening, we start off with kind of terms and definitions because I think it's important that people are on the same page. Like what is a psychic? What is a medium? What is energy work? Because for a lot of people, they're brand new to this. And they really Mm -hmm. don't know what the terms mean. What is astral travel? You know, what are we talking about when we talk about an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience? So uh, I start there by having everybody kind of on the same page and understanding what it is we're going to be talking about and what we're going to be doing for the next two days. And then on the next day, we move right into activities. So we have tools that we play with, energy wheels, um, we do aura readings, zener cards, pendulums, thousand rods, scrying mirrors, uh, oracle card readings. We do psychometry. We do a whole bunch of stuff. And wow. that continues all in one Sunday. day. In one, all wow. in one day. All in one day. I mean, it's an immersion. And I tell people it's an immersion. Mm-hmm. This is not just in the pool. This is jumping in. And then on Sunday, we continue that. And then also on Sunday, I get into some of the business acumen. So I talk about, you know, okay, you've taken Mm -hmm. this class. Now where can you go from here? What's next? Mm -hmm. So I talk about other classes that are out there because there are a lot of modular classes. um, And, you know, many people offer those where it's, you know, one weekend per month for so many months. And I tell them where they can find those because, again, as you stated, it is all about sharing the information. And I'm I'm a firm believer in that there's plenty to go around for everybody. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I have no problem at all referring people to someone else because all of us are here to help one another. I think that that's part of our role. It's part of our service that, that we're here to do. So I think that that's a big part of what we should be doing for each other. So I give them a ton of information about where they can go. I have um, book recommendations for them. Um, I talk about, okay, these are some of the places you can go to possibly work at a fair if you want to hone your skills. I do practice sessions with them. We actually have one coming up um, from the past classes. These are the past graduates. They're getting together on Sunday. And mm-hmm. I have another like, immersion class is coming up in September. Um, so this is kind of, I feel like it's an ongoing thing and it's a build because my desire is that people from previous classes will connect and they will then have a network, just as I was speaking of when I took my classes, they have a network of individuals that, Hey, this person does this, or they know this, or, you know, they went through Lisa's class. So there's a commonality there and it's something that they can build upon. And, Mm -hmm. of course, I'm a resource to them, you know, and I let them know if there's anything that I can do, if there's anything that I can answer beyond this class or give you additional recommendations or send you to someone who can help you along your journey, I'm here. You know, just ask. Let me know that that's something that you're desiring. Anything that I can do to help you along the way, I'll do that. Because I did kind of feel, you know, as I said, when I finished the classes, I was a little deflated because the classes Mm -hmm. were awesome, but I just Mm -hmm. didn't have a clue as to what were the next steps. Mm -hmm. So that is something that I very much focus on as these are options for you. These are some of the things that you Mm -hmm. can do with it. What do you think if you had to distill the main learning objective that would be obtained in the, after that emergence, if you said, well, you're going to come in like this, and when you leave, you will definitely, no matter what you decide to do with it, do what or be what? what be, how would you fill in that blank? You'll be tapped in. <laughs> um, <laughs> you will be tapped in because – and and the proof is in the pudding. That That's the other mm-hmm. piece, I think. Uh, because so many people have an inkling, I think, of maybe there's something more. Or, you know, I, I had this happen or this synchronistic thing occurred or I had this thought or whatever it is that, that, that they imagine. But they're really not sure if it's real. And I think after a weekend immersion, you know it's real. Mm-hmm. Because the proof's in the pudding. You know, you have too many experiences 
during the course of that two and a half days. And it's really amazing how many experiences people have um, that let them know this is real. I really do have a car parked in the garage that I can drive. (laughs) It's mine. I have the keys. (laughs) Now, I've I've heard various theories. The, The phrase says, well, every medium is a psychic, but not every psychic is a medium. So if a person were to want to come in and say, I want to talk to departed loved ones, is that something that is universally available? Like you, I have heard many theories on it, and, and you know, I can only share my thought on it. I do believe that some people have more of an affinity, I guess, to connect with, you know, DLOs, departed loved ones. Um, I think more people have an affinity for it just like I think more people may have an affinity for the psychic side of things. Mm -hmm. So I think it just kind of depends on where your strength lies. And I always equate it to school. Um, It's like being, some people are good at math, you know, Mm. some people are good at Not just people. (laughs) (laughs) So I think it just, really, really depends. And I think that part of going through um, any type of psychic class, not not just mine, mm-hmm. is you get the opportunity to explore many things. So you find out mm-hmm. what you're good at. You find out what your niche is. Are you more on the psychic side? Are you better at just maybe giving the reading and kind of helping the person with past, present, future information? Or are you able to connect with those departed loved ones? And that's mm-hmm. what information is coming through. And we talk about that very much in the class. Like, where is this information coming from? Is it coming from people on the other side? Is it coming from a higher source? Are you connecting across, which would be a more um, empath type of connection? We, mm-hmm. we talk about all those things in the class, and I, I do my best to explain the difference between those, which sometimes is really difficult because sometimes it all feels like it's all rolled into one, Mm -hmm. which in a sense it is, because I always say, you know, I call them my folks. You know, Mm -hmm. it's guys, it's loved ones, it's, you know, Mm -hmm. whoever else is there, helpers, I mean, ancestors. They're my folks. They're all my folks. And so sometimes Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly where it's coming from, but I know that it's from a source beyond myself. And that's a lot of what we focus on in the class is recognizing that this is something that's beyond you. This is not in your mind. This is not an imagination. You didn't just make this up. Like people say, sometimes I just feel like I pulled this information out of nowhere. Well, Mm -hmm. in a sense, you Mm -hmm. did, you know, but it was higher level information that there's no way that you would know. And I, I equate it to the cloud, not the apple cloud, but the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, it's kind of the ether cloud. It's kind of there. Mm-hmm. That information is, is out there and it's available, and you kind of pluck it down. And then you're serving as yeah. a channel or a conduit for that information and sharing it. So we talk now, a lot about that in the past. I, you know, one of my questions is that, I know, and I went to a psychic development class uh, a couple years ago with the Viva Institute, and one of the first things that we went through was really kind of all of the arguments against psychic gifts and abilities, and a lot of it was based on the biblical kind of framework that most people would be approached with when they would start to look at their gifts, Um, and that seemed to be the biggest thing that people would grapple with is the a not the moral okayness of it it would be more like a spiritual okayness of what they were experiencing and grappling with it you know this out of the context of it's not the preacher or the pastor this is me and having to kind of settle that question for themselves of acceptance 
But then on the other hand, there's lots of fear that people will say, well, I just don't want to tap into some spirits and bring back something. Um, you know, there's, I'm sure you've heard many of those conversations. Now, are your students kind of beyond that point since they're sitting in your classroom, or are you still experiencing the energetic presence of fearful belief systems? Honestly, by the time they come to class, they're usually beyond that. I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to be, you know, really frank in saying that mm-hmm. in Canada. Most of the most of the participants are beyond that. Some of them, they have a bit of it, mm-hmm. and we we address it. You know, we talk about it in class. Um, you know, and of course, if people want to talk to me one on one, I'm I'm there. You know, I'm available for that as well. Uh, but generally, if they're there, you know, and I remind them on on the very first evening, if you're here, it's by design. This is a divine mm-hmm. intersection. This is not chance. This is a synchronistic event that is occurring. We're all in this class together for a reason. But mm-hmm. honestly, most of them have come to grips with that, and they've kind of pushed past that enough to be in the class. Um, I do, more than anything, I think I get um, skeptics often. Mm-hmm. I get people that it's maybe not so much kind of the religious dogma, but they're just dealing with their own doubts, okay. you know, self-doubt of, okay, is this truly my intuition talking to me? Am I really tapped in? I have those types of participants more so than I have those that are struggling with the religious dogma, I think, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which for me as a facilitator is wonderful. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, I can't say I, I do have clients, though, that come to me that are still struggling with that, you know, and jokingly, I, I say this, I say, oh, you're here with me cheating on the preacher, you know, and they laugh, <laughs> <laughs> and they laugh, but it's like that uncomfortable laugh, <laughs> and yeah. so, well, we even start this, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. You know, and I ask them, why do you, why do you feel like that? You know, because you are here and you're, you're sitting and you're having an energy session with me or you're having a reading with me. And obviously there must be some portion of you that feels like this is okay. There, there's mm-hmm. got to be something there that feels like it's okay. But then there's also this portion of you that's very uncomfortable with this and feels like maybe you are opening the door or you're dabbling in something mm-hmm. that's not pure. And mm-hmm. I have those conversations. I have very candid conversations with my clients about that. Um, and they're very interesting. It's very enlightening how people kind of view that. But I, I can say that I have seen so much more so many more clients that have come to a greater level of awareness and really kind of addressing the difference between spirituality and religion because they really Mm -hmm. can be two different things. They can be intertwined, but they can also be two Mm -hmm. different things. And I have so many more people that I feel like have a greater level of awareness. And that gives me, that that keeps me hopeful. That keeps me very hopeful Mm -hmm. for us just as humankind that we're coming to that. Me too. Good gracious. <laughs> you know, me personally, <laughs> I've definitely come through. I'm a preacher's kid, you know, and even now and my parents are very accepting of everything that I do. They may not understand it all the time, <laughs> but they, I'm not getting, you know, I'm not getting locked in a room somewhere with a spiritual intervention trying to do an exorcism or something on me. And thank goodness my parents weren't ever of that kind of belief framework anyway but you know 10 15 years ago my parents wouldn't have gone to yoga either because it was not seen as something that was okay for whatever reason but they've been going to yoga you know in the last four or five years and when my mom was talking about shavasana I was like I never thought I would hear those words out of my mother's (laughs) mouth but we're in a new day you know so that's really awesome that there is that kind of relaxing and opening to cross-disciplinary, integrative realities. I'm very happy, <laughs> you know, about that. 
Now, um, you have a Facebook page and a business page. I know people can connect with you in that space. Um, where, how can people reach you and find out these class schedules? Okay, if they go to my website, which is Lisa the X, and it's L I S A T H E X, it's not Fex, it's the X, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. dot com. That is my website. And then if you get on Facebook and you just pull up Lisa the X, either my business page or my personal page will come up. They're sort of interchangeable for me um, because the same information is generally posted both places about upcoming classes, events, anything that I have going on. I try to keep it current on my website and through Facebook. Um, And I admit that I am not a huge social media person uh, because I, I I realize how much time and effort social media takes. <laughs> and, yes, and I'm, I'm, oh my gosh, it's just it's unbelievable to me. And um I also kind of I will attribute part of it to my age because I am in a different generation, but <laughs> I do realize that it's the wave of the future. It's already here, right? It's not even the future. It's the present. So um, I'm working on my savvy. And I actually have my um, 13-year-old daughter uh, who helps me. And she actually Mm -hmm. participates in the psychic immersion class as well. Um, I have her. She comes and she assists me during the psychic immersion because children have, you know, very different energy. You know, young adults have a different energy. Mm -hmm. And I like for the people to see that. I like for my participants to see that. But um, she's my social media tutor. So um, <laughs> if, you listen, if you listen to that, thank you. <laughs> Along with my husband. My husband, Mark, also is, is my tutor as well. So, <laughs> Well, you know, I was going to ask you about what it then is like now your home environment in terms of your kids are like we have a psychic mom and now you're saying okay well you know your daughter is definitely nurtured and encouraged to come with you into your classrooms are your children then uh, exhibiting the openness to psychic abilities is it kind of just matter of fact for their reality that this is norm the new normal where people are tapped into that, and they have that car in their in their garage. <laughs> For my daughter, most definitely, um, because she's kind of been on the journey with me. And as I said, she's thirteen, so she's kind of seen me through this journey. And I I remember like when she was a really little girl. She used to say to me, why don't you just quit that job and just be a medium, mom? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. She was like, you don't like that job anyway. Right, and it was it's so simple, easy. right? <laughs> yeah, it was so simple. And she was saying this to me probably before I really even knew that, you know, before I mm-hmm. knew how disgruntled I was. But mm-hmm. she would say that to me. And I, I, you know, I remember kind of different experiences with her. Of course, we would talk about different things. And her, um, one day we were we were out at a, a metaphysical store, and she was probably about maybe five, I guess. And she said to me, "Why does that man have that blue thing around his head?" And oh, I was like, yeah. "What blue thing?" And so she said, you know, that that color around his head. And I said, oh, you can see his aura. And she said, no. And I said to myself, wow, first of all. And then I said to her, you can see that? And she says, yeah, I can see it. And I said, how come you never told me that before? She said, because I thought everybody could see it. Everybody could do it. Wow. Which really was. It was awesome, and it was so amazing to me, and I just thought, wow. And I I really took that as an opportunity to kind of really nurture her also because I was like, okay, she's she's already telling me this. So I really don't have to do anything. The only thing I really have to do is not dim this down. You know, the Mm -hmm. the bulb is shining brightly, and I don't – I just – the only thing I have to do is just let it shine. And that has always been my my philosophy with her um, in particular. Now, I have a a 17-year-old son, 
as well. And my 17-year-old son has autism. And um, I'm sure you know there are lots of theories about children with mm-hmm. autism in terms of them being at a higher realm and offer and operating, you know, kind of in a different place and time uh, than we do. And that was also a part of my journey as well. I will say that in, in, in this work of wanting to be able to connect with him and to kind of have some common ground because sometimes it's really, really difficult and challenging because they really are operating you know, on another frequency. Yeah. And my my success with that, I will clearly admit, has been somewhat limited. Um, but I have had some moments that I felt like we connected. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was able to have a better level of understanding for him and kind of where he was and what he was going through. But again, I feel like it's part of my evolution. You know, my hope is that one day I'll make a full connection. Right, and I'll be there with well, him. So it's it's um, definitely it keeps me on my toes. It keeps me encouraged uh, with both of them because I feel like they both have gifts, but they're just displayed in different ways. Now, in terms of with your son, um, have you found or did you find that energy, energetic work? with him or with other clients that are in, say, the spectrum. Have you found that to be a helpful thing? Um, Because I know a couple people who really, really do have Reiki uh, treatments with their (coughs) younger child, much younger child, but um, to help just calm and soothe some, some of their energy and have found it to be helpful. Have you done any work yeah. in in that area? Yes, I have. I've done some direct work with him, um, and there is a lot of information on biomat, um, which you know I, I explained earlier is part of my work. There is a lot of information out there about the biomat and autism in particular. Mm-hmm. And the biomat is something that I have utilized with him to help him calm, uh, mm-hmm. because one of the one of the you know the big symptoms with autism is that they're not able to self soothe. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. You know, so they have stimming activities and you know behaviors, other behaviors. So we have found that that has been um, very very helpful with him. Um, He used to utilize it a lot more when he was younger because he was more willing Mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, display still on the mat. But um, as I said, he's 17. So now we have autism and puberty, which is a very Mm -hmm. interesting. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So it's Mm -hmm. not quite as easy to get him to, you know, kind of sit still and lay down on the mat because, you know, we have some, some other things, some other behaviors that we're kind of dealing with. But um, there, there is quite a bit of, of research, I know, specific to the biomat. I have heard some things about Reiki and, and energy work, and I, I have a good friend who is a Reiki practitioner that has done some Reiki on him before. It did seem to calm him, at least for a period of time. Um, mm-hmm. The pranic healing, I have tried to, to do that with him, and I've found that to be not as effective, but I think it probably has more so to do with the technique because you're, you know, waving your hands and clearing mm-hmm. energy mm-hmm. in that way. And for my son, it, it's distracting to him, you know, because right. he's kind of like, okay, what are you doing? What are, what are you doing, mommy? What are, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why are you waving mm-hmm. your hands? So mm-hmm. I think it's very um, individualized. But I definitely feel like energy work is something that can be incorporated into um, part of the protocol or part of maybe the treatment plan for children with autism or even children that have, you know, other challenges. It definitely is something, and and again, see, Joelle, you're you're good because you're hitting on all of the things that (laughs) I would like to bring, I would like to bring to my practice because, 
that is another component that I really would like to do more work, more research on, and make that part of my practice where I am working with children that have autism or, as I said, some other challenges that maybe they need some type of soothing um, techniques Mm -hmm. or the parents Mm -hmm. need some sort of strategies to really help the children. Uh, And I'm hoping that that's going to come. I'm not going to say hope. I I know it's going to come. Yes. I just feel like it might be be down the road, but it's coming. Well, I have a couple people that I will be connecting you with in the coming weeks because uh, one of the, you know, the library has come virtually to obtain information just like a library. And so as part of that, I do offer classes and workshops, not that I'm necessarily teaching, but that other people are bringing forth. And a lady is in production right now for her class, which is going to be, we just said no, and it is um, treating ADHD without medication. And she's a social worker who has two sons, one who was um, um, having ADHD diagnosis kind of pushed towards him, and she decided to use her skills as a clinical social worker and her and her husband to develop a program with non-medication to, excuse me, to um, help their child be successful, both their children, even the one is not quote unquote diagnosed. So she is going to be putting together, she's in the process of putting together her class and absolutely the energetic component, you know, if you're talking about your family environment, first of all, being supportive, that is an energetic principle without ever calling yourself an energy healer. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if yeah. you and your, your mate have decided to embrace your child as as they are rather than uh, as something to be cured or fixed, but something to just some someone to just be supported so that he can be he or she can be their best self possible. That's an energetic intention, right there. So if you're that adding nutrition. <laughs> You know, you're adding nutrition, you're adding energy works more specifically, uh, crystals and aromatherapies and all manner of things that um, can help with sensations and stuff. So I definitely would be connecting to you and her to do some some, uh, bringing forth of something. You know, I just really love how I get to have these conversations with people and find out all of this juicy stuff that then, you know, sparks a seed of something else to be to be growing. And I will say I was prompted as you were talking about your daughter to ask her, it was like, okay, so are you teaching any classes for young people or young people and their parent on um, developing their abilities at a younger age? Are, are you teaching kids classes or parents and kids yet? I have done some in the past. I've actually done both. I've I have done a kids crystal class. Um so it was, you know, to kind of teach children about the power of crystals and how these aren't just pretty rocks and, you know, how they may benefit you. So I have done that in the past. I've also done a class called Your Psychic Child where mm-hmm. it is uh both the parents and the children and mm-hmm. I do talk to the parents about, okay, you know, you have this child, how do, you, how do you nurture this child? How do you develop this child and let them know that what they're experiencing is not something to be afraid of, it's not something weird or odd, and then how do you as a parent understand it as well? Because usually what happens, if you have a, if you have a parent that's tapped in, then they can definitely raise a child that's tapped in. But let's say you have a a parent that's a little unsure, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're kind of like, oh, there's something going on, but I don't really know. And is this something that, you know, I should be encouraging or, or what? And I feel like coming to the class, again, is a way for them to gain knowledge, for them to get information for themselves as a parent and for their children. And then they can make an educated decision. They can mm-hmm. decide, okay, what do I want to do with this or how far do I want to go? Um, I've not done any psychic development classes with younger, young adults um, as of yet, 
that may be something that comes down the road. But honestly, I really enjoy working with the adults um, because those are the parents, <laughs> you know. Those, <laughs> those, those are the people that have the greatest influence on their children. So I feel like if I can impart the knowledge to them, then they can then Mm -hmm. raise aware, enlightened children. So that's kind of, (laughs) that's my tactic, you know, that that's my strategy for now. But yes, definitely. I I have done some things in the past and I'm sure I'll be doing some things in the future. Um, For me, you know, a lot of classes that I've developed, you know, I, I know when I develop it, I'll be doing this again. This is a class mm-hmm. that I know I will repeat, you know, at some other time or some other venue. And I have so many ideas, I think, for classes and things that I want to do. And sometimes I think, you know, okay, am I going to have enough time in my lifetime <laughs> to put this down? But, again, I know that the things that are most important, the things that I'm supposed to put out there in terms of classes or products, I know it's going to happen. So I trust mm-hmm. that. I know my guys are my guys are going to give me that opportunity. Well, I think that is wonderful. I actually have not run across any local classes that are geared towards young people, but I don't have any young people in my world. I'm not a mother, so that might be why they're not into my awareness, you know, Uh, because I certainly see the teenagers shopping at Phoenix and Dragon and at Synchronicity before they close, you know. So I know there's an awareness, and there's actually quite a lot of products now that are books uh, for teens and young adults and Oracle decks that are geared to teens and young adults. So I definitely know they wouldn't be making them if the market wasn't there. So I'm kind of glad that they don't have to wait till they're my age of what, when I was 35 or 37 or something just started coming in. So awareness, they can really just never have to, like you said, dim. They're not dimmed ever. They can just shine. And to me, that's exciting because then they will exceed what we even have an awareness of as possibility because they weren't pushing through the same mental blocks or the uh, uh, existence blocks or reality blocks of just corporate matrix and and things like that. They're they're not going to have to shed that as they uh, grow into their maximum potential. That's really exciting. (laughs) Yes, it is. I, I totally agree with you and it's very exciting to me as well. And we, I I just think that they come with a, you know, much higher level of awareness about a lot of things. And, you know, this is just kind of another component that we can share with them. And I think that, you know, as we evolve as adults, you know, we're, we're raising and bringing forth these evolved children. So as you said, they don't, they don't have to go through, you know, some of the spiritual muck (laughs) that we had to trudge through. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now um, I do want to circle back around. We're in just the final few minutes, but you did mention working at one point on a phone line. And I really uh, would love to know a little bit more about, um, well, I guess my my thing is that I used to approach phone work with great skepticism because the whole Miss Cleo era was when I was in high school probably and the whole 900, the rise of the 900 number psychic lines that you would see advertised late at night. And this was, of course, before the Internet (laughs) and the whole keen.com now. And so it really got a bad rap. I meet many, many psychics who say, you know, I used to read for the phone lines when I first started coming out, and I learned to be quick and efficient, and, you know, I learned to tap in right away and get it done. So can you you know, what can you share about, you know, accessing phone-based services and, and web-based services in terms of a way of psychically connecting with a, a reader in this age? Well, for me, now, I didn't do the, the psychic hotlines. All of my clients were right. direct to me. Okay. So, you know, it was, kind of, it was a referral system, basically. So somebody okay. would get a reading with me, and they would say, oh, I know this lady who does phone readings. So I never worked the professional lines. Um, okay. I have you know, many, many friends who have done that in the past. 
Um, but in terms of the connection for, for me, again, because that is the way that I started, it is really no different than an in-person um, connection for a reading. Now, with the healing, it's a little bit different for me because I can do remote healings, and that is a portion of my work. I've, I've done that. But um, the healing is a little bit different because I'm really kind of touching and feeling the energetic field. Mm-hmm. So that that is something that, you know, I'm doing in person. But with a phone reading, um, I don't find that connection to be really any different than an in-person reading because it's still kind of the same process for opening channel and tapping in. And mm-hmm. I know for me, you know, of course, I'm, I'm saying a prayer of protection. I'm opening my channel. And then I'm calling that person, you know, at the designated time and saying, okay, let, let's begin our reading. Um, mm-hmm. I always start my readings with asking the person what they would like to focus on. I really like for people to kind of have certain things in mind, which I generally feel like people do have things in mind, because I think when they contact a psychic, there's something that they want to know more about. There's something they're seeking direction on or they want guidance on. So I always start off by saying, you know, what would you like to focus on today? Mm-hmm. And generally people will have a couple of areas. Sometimes they have only one thing. <laughs> but usually they have mm-hmm. maybe two or three areas they would like to focus on, and then I see where the guides take me. And then I go mm-hmm. ahead and I do the reading. Um, one thing that I do that's a little bit different, I do this in person and on phone readings, is I do something, I call it my psychic scribble, but I write. It's sort mm-hmm. of like an automatic handwriting, but it's more of a, like I said, like a psychic scribble. Because what I found is information comes very quickly, so it's my way of trying to collect it. But I've also noticed that when I've tried to read it afterwards, I cannot read it. But I realize it's Mm -hmm. not for me. It's for the client. It's for the person that's having the reading. So Mm -hmm. I have found, you know, people have told me that have had readings with me that those notes were very helpful. They'll say, Mm -hmm. you know, Lisa, I held on to those notes from our session. It was awesome. I looked at it a year later. You know, I've had people snap pictures of it and text it to me mm-hmm. and say, you know, you told me this and this is what occurred. And I'm like, I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, I mean, I'm looking at the handwriting like that doesn't even look right. like my handwriting to me. But, you know, I know what it is. And, you know, you know because you do readings that it's very much an altered state. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It, it is is not something that I'm holding on to or that I'm aware of. Right. But, you know, for me, I, I think I appreciate, and, and maybe this is, you know, the facilitator part of me, you know, just like you were talking about the librarian portion of you, to mm-hmm. see that, you know, to that they have those tangible notes. And even when they right. walk away from a chronic healing session and they have those tangible notes, um, I feel like that I've, I've shared something. You know, that I've, I've, mm-hmm. I've gifted them with something that's tangible that they can hold on to. And I know the bottom line is it's always what they go and do with it and that I have mm-hmm. no control over it. But at least I feel like I've done my part. So it's kind of like when I tear off that sheet of paper and I pass it to them across the table, it's something, it means something to me. It's special to me that I've mm-hmm. given you something. Now, go out there and rule the world, you know, but and <laughs> and drive I, your and car. <laughs> drive your car. Go out there and do right. it. But I, I really, you know, I found that that, again, that's something that came into my work really early when I was doing the phone readings, that I was doing this writing portion. Um, mm-hmm. But, of course, for a phone reading, they're not able to get those notes. But I even had clients that would say, take a picture of them and send them to me, mm-hmm. right, you know, text right. it to me. <laughs> and, and, again, you know, I, I was like, wow, this, this is really, you know, some evolution happening here. And I really feel this, and I feel this connection to this writing, even though I can't read the writing. <laughs> right. But it's, it's not mine. You know, it's not mine. It's not for me. Mm-hmm. So. I've come I've come to understand that. But I, I you know, to circle back to your original question, yes, I think the connection is the same. 
Well, I will say we're in our last little minute here, but you have definitely left something with me this evening, and I'm sure that my listeners will agree. I really appreciate our conversation this evening, and I do want to let our listeners know that it is um, going to be posted over to YouTube in about a week or so, so uh, we'll be able to send out links to anyone who might have missed it or not been able to stay up for the full episode. But, Lisa, I just thank you so much for joining me on the Psychic Inside show tonight. I'm giving you a big hug right now. <laughs> and I'm giving you back because it was wonderful. It was so great to talk to you. And, you know, I, I really hope that the listeners enjoyed it because I could feel their energy. I know you always can feel their energy, but I could feel their energy yeah. as well. <laughs> um, and I want to say I do have a psychic immersion class coming up, so anybody who's interested, please, please go to my Facebook page or please go to my website. I would love to have you in class. Um, journey inward and find yourself. You're there. Well, I will be putting that information out for the listeners on my page uh, tomorrow when I post your show link from today. And I expect that I will see you at an event very soon uh, since I am here in the Atlanta area. And I would love to uh, avail myself of your knowledge and wisdom. So uh, thank you, Lisa. And to each of you, I hope that this week you have all of the blessings that you can possibly hold to overflowing and that you are just covered with the love that is out there in the universe for all of us. Until next week on The Psychic Inside and on Thursday on The Vibrant Show, just sending you high vibes and positive energy. Namaste. Namaste.